and terribly painful subject to address. Um, but we hope tonight to be able to not just take on the challenging issue, but also give some answers and hopefully come away with some sense of uh, practicality. Um, what I'd like to ask is that if those of you, uh, how many of you listen to WFA? Wow, thank you very much. All right, so you know we've been covering this issue for years. And sadly, I think we've covered it for years to come. So if you, uh, tonight, in terms of the discussion and the question and answer period afterwards, Mike Collins might ask you to make the comment or the question brief, because this is not the only time we'll be addressing this. So I'll be right outside that door if you think there's something that we didn't cover, or there's something that we should have done or something that we could have done with it. So you can always reach me at joe at wfae.org. Or if you want to get anyone in the newsroom about an idea around this subject or a comment, you can go news at wfae.org. We look forward to hearing from you. Uh, as always, as we are on the air, uh, we do so and uh, tell all our stories with the utmost respect that we possibly can, particularly on a difficult subject for jurors. Cell phones, we have them. I see people already taking pictures. Cell phones on sound, please, not silent. Make sure that it's on that way. And then I want to introduce the uh, very talented award-winning executive producer, Charlotte Talks, when you can All right, thank you for coming tonight. Um, just a couple of technical things about tonight's show. We're going to record our show in three segments tonight, um, just the way that it would air um, in the morning for a normal Charlotte Talks. We're going to pause just long enough to sort of reset things, reset our clocks, and that sort of thing, and then keep going. Um, and so after the recording is over, we're going to spend the rest of the evening on questions and answers. So you'll have a lot of opportunity, probably over half an hour, opportunity to um, talk with the panel on stage. We will have microphones roving around the room for you to ask questions of our panel. Um, the show will air, if it's not live, it'll air tomorrow morning at 9 on WFAE, um, or you can go to WFAE.org. Um, and if you're following the discussion on social media tonight, we are going to be on Facebook Live there. Um, but you can tweet at Charlotte Talks. We have a hashtag, WFAE PubCon. Um, and of course, if you want to uh, see the Facebook Live later on, it's, uh, you can find us at WFAE on Facebook. Um, so thank you very much for coming tonight. We'll get started. <coughs> Yes, thank you all for being here. Good evening. Um, we'll start in a second, but um, we have a lot of people up here. And we're going to do this with the grown people first, and then we'll, in the third segment of the show, we'll hand it over to the younger people and get their perspective, because we, we always talk about young people. We never talk to them. So I thought it would be fun and interesting to hear from them. So we will hear from them later on tonight. So we're just going to do this like we're doing it, but there won't be any music. He just asked me, will there be music? Oh, he's, he's like into the music. <laughs> well, you got to listen tomorrow. And there's no music? Is that it? No, you got to listen tomorrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, add it in the post. Are you ready? You ready? Let's do it. This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. Charlotte's homicide count is alarmingly high. At just a little over the halfway point in 2019, the number of homicides has eclipsed all of last year. CMPD Chief Kirkbundy has called this a community health issue and has asked for cooperation from the community to get a handle on the use of guns to solve disagreements. So this hour, we are at Friendship Missionary Baptist Church for a WFAE public conversation on what is being done in the community by community members to address not just the homicide problem, but conditions that often lead individuals to make hair trigger decisions that change countless lives forever. Statistics show that most of the people committing homicides in Charlotte know their victims. Statistics show most of the people involved in violent altercations are under the age of 25. We've talked about those young people many times in the past, but later this hour we will talk with three young people about the role of violence and the prospect of violence plays in their lives, and ask them to share their thoughts on how to prevent that violence. But first, we hear from three individuals who know the community conditions that create a favorable atmosphere for trouble, and who have been working to find ways to short circuit those conditions and lower the temperature by helping people find alternative methods of conflict resolution. 
Robert Dawkins is the political director for Action NC and the founder and state organizer for Safe Coalition NC that's made up of over 15 community-based advocacy groups dealing with gun violence. Welcome back to the program. That's right. Good to see you. You can applaud if you want. <laughs> Just to prove to our radio listeners that there's somebody actually here. <laughs> Greg Jackson is founder of Heal Charlotte. That's a community engagement group providing after school and day camps for at risk youth, but that just scratches the surface of what Greg does in the community. Thank you for coming back. Appreciate it. And Cedric, not the entertainer, but Cedric Dean is founder of SAVE, Safeguard, Atone, Validate, Educate. That's a mentoring program working with young people. Nice to have you with us tonight. You know, we talk a lot about this alarming number of homicides and how we're on track to beat last year. This is not the worst year ever, even if we finished the year at double what last year's was, or even double where we are today. Uh, but I'd like to hear from each of you before we talk about things being done in the community about what your opinions are, what the driving factors behind this rising homicide rate is. Yes, guns are prevalent. Without the guns, we'd have a lower homicide rate. But that's just one factor. So let me start with you and go down the panel. Robert Dawkins. So one of the things you mentioned, Mike, is even if we were to get to 150 murders, this doesn't equal the numbers that we had in the early 90s, where we had 122 murders and Charlotte was only 400,000 people. So statistically, it's nearly impossible to get back to those numbers. What we did know from the early 90s was what was driving it. We knew it was the crack epidemic. That we knew, and that's when we had treated it. We knew in 2007 when there was another spike, we knew what the issue was, we identified it, and it was gang violence. And that was hidden by the kings, crips, bloods, all of that and we were able to address it. What we've got to do now is to figure out, because both, both of those were epidemics, we have to figure out what are the causes of this epidemic that we have now. And I know people are quick to go to uh, safe solutions, and they'll say, oh, it's over mobility, it's this, it's that. But we need evidence-based data and evidence-based solutions. If it was just upward mobility, then our rate wouldn't stagger the way it is. Right. 2017 it was up dramatically, 2016 was down, 2017 was up, 2018 was down, 2019 is up. We've got to invest the same amount of time in identifying what are the pure causes of this, the same way we did to say it's crap, the same way we did to say it was game violence. Uh, Cedric, you, you said something to one of our producers that really was troubling. You said that too many young people think like animals instead of human beings, and that in part has, uh, is, is what has led to the rise in these homicides. Why? Why do they think of each other that way? Because we in America has made it popular to kill people. We allow our kids to kill 30 to 300 times a day playing games like Fortnite and Grand Theft Auto. I deal with kids. Kids that have killed people. And you know the first thing they take? Man, I just had to see what it was like to get the real thing. So when you are shooting there, sitting there shooting a gun all day long on a, on a video game, and all you do is kill people, and you get points for killing. Then when you get out of the street, and you see somebody that will give you a gun for little or nothing, and now when you got that gun, and that gun start talking to you, Somebody look at you the wrong way. Next thing you know, that fast, and it's over. So when you think about why are we killing the way we kill, just think about a couple simple things. One, we took church out of school. When we did that right there, right, we took character. People don't see each other as human beings. They see each other as animals because we allow our kids, right, to just sit there and fight and kill and do whatever, and then all we do is say, we gotta do another study. Yeah. But you don't really have to do a study, you just gotta talk to the kid. Chief Putney has called this a community health crisis, I mentioned that in the, in the opening, and, and Greg, you agree with that, you said that that's a good first step to recognize gun violence as a community health problem. But how does recognizing that 
help you make headway at solving the problem? Well, when you think, all right, so our pastor says this a lot, right? Our pastor, P.L. Schaefer, he says, as soon as you are immediately aware of something, you are immediately responsible for something, right? So the conversation has to happen, and you have to bring something to light so everybody's aware of it. But to get to your last question, and what we kind of tell these kids at Hill Charlotte, there's an integrity problem, there's a passion problem, Kids are passionate about the wrong thing. The integrity isn't there in the community. There is no purpose for these children. So they're walking around finding purpose on the street, which isn't conducive to how they live. And then the legacy that you follow is part of the legacy that you live out. Yeah. So right now, what we're trying to do is recreate what these kids' legacies are. A lot of them are still gonna be the first ones to graduate from high school, the first ones to graduate from college, first ones not to have to go to jail, the first ones not to have to go in a courthouse. Those things play your family. And when you get used to that happening inside of your home, that culture in the home is broken. It's broken, it really is. And these kids have grown up in broken homes and the confidence isn't there. And as far as adults, there's no accountability anymore. I came up in an era, I'm an 80s baby, man. I came up in an era where there was a grandma down the block that was gonna hold me accountable if my mother wasn't home. As much even if I wanted to go out and venture off and do something, it was somebody's parent, somebody's auntie, somebody's mama, besides just an officer, besides just the teacher, but it was somebody on that block that really, really cared. There was a lot of conduits for the community. And there aren't a lot of conduits now and bridge builders for the community. We have a lot of finger pointers. This ain't my job, that ain't my job, this your job, this your job, this his job, this her job. It's everybody's job. We have a motto in Hill Charlotte, if everybody did a little bit, nobody would have to do a lot. I seen a kid smoking weed in the park the other day. I, I didn't come yell at him and get upset with him, but I told him, look around, man. Look at what you're doing right now. You got your son with you. That's a legacy he's gonna follow, fix it. And he immediately fixed it. It's just the way that you talk to these young kids now. They need to see somebody that looks like them, that been through what they've been through, showing them a positive way, man. Like really showing them a positive way. So Robert, I know you want to jump in on this. Yeah, so uh, I agree with a plenty of things that Greg is saying. And there's a few things I do want to point out. I think Chief Putney, when he's saying it's a, it's a community epidemic, that's an easier way of saying what it really is. And what it really is, is it's a public health epidemic. And it has to be treated scientifically, the same way that we treat any other uh, disease. We have to treat violence as a disease. And that's why there's three things that if you're gonna treat things as a public health uh, disease, and they covered some of it. First, you have to adequately identify the problems with evidence-based. Then you have to come up with evidence-based solutions. And the part that they talked about, you gotta change community norms. But the big part is you also have to be real with yourself. And I see a lot of people not being real with themselves. And what we tell each other is, oh, this generation is so out of control because we're 50 and we got kids. And I wanna take you back to the 80s because I, I was a 70s baby and I was around in the 80s. We killed people like crazy in the 80s. The 80s had the highest rates of killing in Charlotte. You best not go to rural village, you will get laid out. We would not be talking about no 70 murders. 70 murders is a thing that came about in Charlotte in the early 2000s. We laid people down in the street, but now we are grown and we want to act like, since we're parents, that this is something new. The rap generation that I grew up in every day, still was talking about playing Fortnite. I got to get home to play Fortnite. I listen to folks saying, I'm gonna introduce your brains to the street every day in my car. Very few people, there are kids with guns now. We all had guns today. So I can read, but not, correct me if I'm wrong, I wasn't part of that scene, but the, the guns in the 80s were, were well, I wasn't. <laughs> the, gun, the guns back then were used in drug deals, and drug deals that went wrong. And, 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 and between gangs later on, I think, in, in, in our history in Charlotte, country. Today, we talk a lot about building trust between this community of young people and the police. 
It seems to me that they don't trust each other. The young people don't have trust for each other. That's why they're so quick, or partly why they're so quick to use a gun. That's why, that's why I, just to jump in real quick, that's why I'm talking about character values. And I can easily put it on the themes of the city and say it's gentrification and yeah, social justice. We can easily say that, but I'm talking about the character of these kids and the low empathy that walks around on these streets every day. It, when you start to value your life, you start to value other people's lives. When people are instilling in you moral values of how to live and be a productive citizen, it's contagious. It's contagious. I got kids that are contagious to being right and being good because it's what's around them all day. We, we talked before the sh this show started, you and I, Greg, about yeah. uh, how difficult it is to get these young people, once they make a bad decision, not to make another bad decision. Even though they try, they end up making another bad decision. I know, Cedric, you uh, have experience in prison. You went to prison for selling uh, cocaine, I think, for five and a half years, and now you were to try to, for longer than that? Yeah, 22 years, okay. uh, now friends. I'm sorry. <laughs> but now you're out, and you're working with young people, young people now, and I want to hear from you about why it is so difficult, or why it seems that young people are so willing to pick up a gun and do something that they've seen destroy lives around them. Why, why doesn't that seem to have an impact? Because it's in the environment that they live in. I can speak, when you talk about, and this is no disrespect to Rob, that's my friend. And when you talk about empirical evidence, right, I can take you, and I got three police officers that was part of our program that we do at um, Timber Ridge Apartments and we was at the uh, Hickory Grove Library. 15 kids that was out there when they had that murder the other day, right? They witnessed firsthand the shooting. They could tell you why the shooting went down, tell you how the shooting happened, tell you who beefing with who. But you know what? When you do a study, you ain't talking to them kids like that. So when my point, my point is this right here. The resources at the Mecklenburg County Tech, right? When these individuals, because the same people CMPD and Tech, the same people with their ankle monitors on, them the same people that go and come and back and forth. But guess what? When they get out, they can't get in the programs because they are violent. So all the programs that really the, the funding is going to that can really help an mm -hmm. uh, individual like that, they exempt from them because they won't want nothing to do with it. I know Robert Dawkins wants to jump in on this. We have to take a break, we'll do it by that. After we come back from the break, it's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. I need my music. You need to do it. <laughs> 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 Isn't the music? Oh, yeah. The music <laughs> like was the <laughs> It was that popular, we play it all the time, and I'm not doing any talking. You really got to jump in and say, CPI security. <laughs> 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 We're gonna go. We're having too much fun. Here we go. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFAG, a special WFAE public conversation coming to you from the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, a community uh, approach to addressing homicide. We're here with Robert Dawkins, founder of Safe Coalition and C, Greg Jackson, founder of Heal Charlotte and Cedric Dean. Founder of SAVE, Safeguard, Atone, Validate, Educate, all three organizations working with young people to try to help them find their way in a really complicated environment. So, Robert, you wanted to jump in on what Cedric was talking about. And Cedric's talking about what you normally get in the environment through the city or through whatever. Some people go and knock uh, in doors to get comfortable and give you a survey. I'm talking public health. I'm talking the same way when Charlotte had a hepatitis issue over off the Little Rock, every door gets knocked. I'm talking about a scientific, every door gets knocked. To give you an example, Oakland, and I'm big on, on um, uh, epidemiological fixes. So Oakland went and did their thing and they said, we need to treat 17 to 24 year olds because this is the people that we believe are killing the murder, doing the murder. Murder rate that went down zero. The population that they should have been treating was 25 to 32. 
Because in their state, the murders were being caused by 25, 32 year olds. Mm -hmm. Once they went door to door, and we're talking about scientific people, not your uncle that's well and passionate and coming out with a little push survey. When, when the health department had a problem with brain eat the needle, brain eat the needle got stopped. And brain eat the needle got stopped in two weeks because when you deem that a public health system, we're not talking about are you happy with this? We're, what did you do yesterday? What were you thinking about yesterday? What was the causes of you thinking about that yesterday? What is, because Senate can give you some real causes, but that's one symptom of our homicides. All of the people, and this might shock y'all, that all of the people is doing the killing in Charlotte ain't black. Mm -hmm. I really like to say this, but everybody's doing the killing in Charlotte ain't black. If you look at where murders are happening, they're happening all over Charlotte. They're talking about one facet of what we need, and that's community norms. And I'll tell you another community norm that's got to be changed is, is the domestic violence community norm. And until you get people to see women as not an object and not, because if you go and look, black or white, if you go back and look at the shootings, and I'm not the data guy, but I shot you because you said something to my girl, I said something because you was the, the baby daddy came over, and it all goes back to women being objectified. So until you change that is one of your criteria, you can tell me all day, if I don't find a gun, I'm gonna kill you with a knife, I'm gonna hit you over the head, I'm gonna do whatever. So we talk guns all the time, but guns are easy. If you wanna kill somebody, you gonna kill them. And how do we get that effort to kill folks? Because white folks will kill you over meth, the same way black people will kill you over crack. And one of the things epidemiologically we need to do is stop always phrasing this on what's comfortable. And the comfortable things to say, they don't have any choice because they're poor. What do you expect from black people that have been disadvantaged? But people have to have control over their self. And each said it's right. Some of it came from taking the churches out. Some of it came from broken families. But what I will say, while everybody's talking gun prevention, we're talking gun interruption and gun intervention. And the two things I like about these two people sitting here is their programs aren't nine to five and they go home. He on the corner of Amy James, he's up on the corner at 12 o'clock at night because having a kid talking to you is Saturday at two o'clock ain't gonna stop him from getting killed at 11 o'clock on the sale. He's there on the corner of the sale. He's there on the corner of Amy James. So all three of you mentored these young people and, and Greg, as we talked before the, the program, you, you've been known to take them in and give them a place to sleep. Uh, and, and, and kind of guide them, even though they fail you from time to time. And I'm sure that all of you uh, see failures every day, that you're, that you're working your hardest to change, and it just doesn't happen. How, what keeps you going? So I'm, I'm gonna break. I'll just go ahead and say, I'm not, this ain't me right here. So I'm completely out of my flesh. So I'm, this ain't, I'm called to do this. You can't choose to do this type of work. I don't know who would, if you would, you're crazy. All right? This is an absolute call, and I'm completely in my purpose. The most high has turned me around, right? So help, help the people listening to us on the radio who have no interaction with these young people. Help them to understand who they are, what their lives are like, and we'll talk to some young people in a second, but what their lives are like, what you're up against, what they're up against. Um, I mean, it depends what child you want to talk about. You want to talk about the young child that lives right the next building to me that needs me to drive him to camp every day because his mom goes to work at 9 o'clock and doesn't get home till 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and I might have to feed him two, three times a day. Or you want to talk about the young lady that lives in a hotel room and would do anything possible to not have to go home to that. And she would stay with me and babysit my kids all day if she could. So she doesn't have to go back to that environment and have to see that because they're only with me in the summertime from 10 to 4. They're with me in after school from 3.30 to 6.30. When they leave me, they go back to YouTube, they go back to Instagram, they go back to poverty, they go back to an environment that tells them they ain't gonna be nothing. And they're not going, and that courage, and that confidence, and that integrity, and that passion, and that purpose that you keep instilling in them day after day, if you are outnumbered by the opposition, these are little kids, man. It's hard for them to keep that. It's hard for them to hold on to that. It is easy to be discouraged 
and unhappy and say, this is what it's going to be. But it's not just the kid's fault. It's a great thing. Let me tell you something. It's not, it's, not, it's not ever the kid's fault. No kid come out the womb cursing. No kid come out the womb packing a nine. No kid come out the womb smoking weed. Kids come out crying for their parents. That's what they come out crying for. Definitely. Most of the kids that I work with, and first of all, for the explain, right? We talked about me. I want to be clear with that, right? At the age of 13, I was baptized in the street. I became a thug. A person put a gun in my hand. I used to shoot drug dealers because he said, when you walk up to him, you put one in the leg, and then you say, you know what the next one going, you point it to his head. So this is how the training takes place. Now back in my time though, you had 16 year olds that went to jail and you was around adults. They done kind of cured that. But when you look at the kids that's out there right now, and you got a mother that's in prison and a daddy that's dead, or you got a father that's on drugs and a mother that's missing in action, right? Now you got a grandmother trying to do everything she can to raise six kids. She don't have no help, she don't have no resources. And then you got organizations, which I won't name, but y'all know who they are. They tell you, Mr. Dean, you can't take these kids to church. You know, that's a liability. You got organizations that say, we can't put kids inside of a van to take them where they need to go. This is public organizations. And I'm tired of people putting politics before the people. When you talk about the children that we got, I'm talking about the churches that's out there on every block that can take these kids and bring them into that church. This is where they at. So let's, let's, let's talk about uh, what the three of you do and your organizations and organizations like yours do and what you wish other organizations would start doing that would have an impact on uh, bringing these kids toward a better life. What do you do, uh, Robert Dawkins? Tell me what your organization does. My wife asked me that every day. I'm not coming at you. Get this right. But, you know, so we're wrong. more of the policy side. So Cedric and those are working on the actual streets. And I don't forget, we do grassroots organizing. Mm -hmm. Grassroots organizes the workforce. Our job is to build power in neighborhoods, whether it's Lake Harbor, whether it's uh, Heritage Park, whether it's any of those. The issues that need to be worked on, we find out, and we're the ones that go to City Council, County Commission, General Assembly, they tell us no and quit and we come back. But we, we, we go and we try to work on those issues. What I can tell you, I want to follow up on what Cedric said. Cedric gave you the smaller example. What we find is that groups like Cedric's, groups like Greg's, have a harder time to get funding than groups that do the superficial stuff. Why? So, why? why? Because why people give money, people give money to groups that already have money to, to, to continue and fulfill that project. So until Greg and those can get to a point of funding to where it's like, this costs 100,000 and I got 80,532 and I just need 20,000 from you, it's hard to get money. So we got Greg and Cedric on the street with their own credibility because you you guys have walked the, you walk the talk because you've lived the life. Mm -hmm. You know what you're talking about. You know where these kids are because you were there. Yeah. So what works in your minds best? How when you where you have success stories to tell, yeah. what have you done that worked out right? I was consistent. Yeah. Every day. Mm -hmm. Consistent. Yeah. It builds trust. And when kids can trust consistency, it, it, it changes how they look at life. They are used to inconsistency. They're used to somebody saying, I'm gonna come get you next week, and they don't come to get me next week. They're used to saying, yo, we gonna take you out, and they don't never go out. They're used to inconsistency, and that consistency built this amount of trust that I have with not only these kids, but with their families to where I can send a phone call and I can say, I'm taking them here. I'm taking them to the White Water Center. And the parents are like, please go. Because wherever you're going with them, I know they're in good hands. 
And, and to, to Robert's point with, with the funding thing, he's, he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. But why would you fund me? I don't do it the way you want me to do it. I don't do it the way you want me to. I don't abide by your rules and your regulations. And somebody told me from an organization I wrote, and I said, well, you met me protesting, so I might be. It's, you're absolutely right. But I'm not going to meet your standards because your standards does not fit my community. My community doesn't need what you think they need. They need what we give it. And if you trust me, you would give it to me. But you can't trust something that's actually going to fix the problem. Why would you? Because you need the problem to exist. <laughs> So I created an organization, Save, Safeguard, Tone, Validate, Educate, to give restorative hope. What happens is when these kids get to a position 
where they feel they have no hope at all. And like Greg and Robert said, and no one cares. No one cares because what happens is this. You go to a correctional facility or you go to a training school, right? Guess what they do? This is me. This is what I know for a fact. They say, look, I can't really help these people the way you can because if I help them, I ain't gonna have no job. So it's like the more of you come back, the more job security I get. Wow, that's awesome. Now that's just, this, this, this is the life that I live. So for 22 years and 11 months, but you know what I mean? For 12 cents an hour, it can never be about the money. I went down every day and I did a job with somebody that was making $80,000. Mm -hmm. But you know I did it with integrity because I didn't want these kids, the, the kids of these individuals that was in prison to end up in prison. So it all goes back to sitting there saying, hey man, I'm gonna come to your basketball game with you, right? I'm gonna sit out there the whole time, but your behind coming to church with me Sunday morning. And it's a trade-off, and they'd be happy to do it. So when you talk about, or, and when I, so when I got out of prison, Charlene Henderson and Tijuana Brown, Tijuana Brown had been in prison. She had a daughter in prison, and it was committed. She, she said, I, I will never have any of my kids go to prison. So what we did as an organization, Charlene, and she had been faced with murder. Her brother was brutally murdered, shot in the back of the head right here in Charlotte. Her niece was left dead in the field. So she knew it firsthand. So when I went to her, I said, look, we got to figure out a way to make these kids job ready instead of jail ready. And credit the CLPD. I said it. You know why? Because when I first got out, I went to Chief Putney at a form like this right here. I said, you know the thing I don't respect about you? That if I wanted to cooperate to help incarcerate these kids, you would let me. But I want to help save them. And he gave me the first job that I ever had. And he paid me to go out there and save these kids. And he got me where I could go in the schools like Thomas Burrow Academy and sit down and take these kids that was on that school to prison pipeline and bring these kids out to churches and to other places and deal with that inherent stresses that they got. What he talking about, when he talking about a mental health crisis, if you got your baby mama boyfriend at home touching on them, when they come to school and they take them out on the principal and the teacher, that's this place to question. Cedric Dean is the founder of SAVE. Greg Jackson is the founder of Heal Charlotte. Robert Dawkins is the founder of Safe Coalition and C. When we come back, we're going to hear from some young people who have yeah. helped by these people. Okay, let's all 
say a little prayer to see if I can get through this. All right? Okay. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. And my columns is a public conversation on the community approach to homicides. And for the first time, I think in a very long time, if not ever, we're going to actually talk to young people in this segment from Friendship Missionary Baptist Church. We've spoken so many times about young people, we rarely get a chance to talk to them about anything, much less about violence. But most of the people who are impacted by violence in Charlotte, particularly by homicide, are people who know each other and people who are under the age of 25. So we're going to talk to some people about violence and how it impacts their lives. This is uh, Trinity uh, Snowden. She is 15 years old and she is uh, at Turning Point Academy, one of Cedric Dean's mentees, I guess it's the way to say it, is that right? And also uh, with Beauty After the Bars, uh, to one of the uh, uh, do uh, Brown. Brown's group. Thank you for helping. See, you're great. You're already great. You're helping me. Out. Sylvia Clark is 22 years old, studying criminal justice at CPCC, uh, and she uh, is uh, with Greg Jackson's organization, uh, Heal Charlotte. And Yassine Major is 18 years old. He graduated from Harding High School in June and plans to attend UNC Pembroke in the fall. He volunteers with Heal Charlotte. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. best use of our time, and I'm not sure who to ask this question of, how safe or unsafe do you feel on a regular basis in your neighborhood, in your lives? Uh, I'll just, I'll start with you. Trinity. On a regular basis, I feel unsafe, especially when I be going to school, because I have to wake up early in the morning and watch my surroundings. I go out, I hear gunshots, I just, like, I just stop and be like, I don't even live in the neighborhood. So it feels like I can't even bring out my little sibling, take them to the park, and enjoy yourself because it just don't feel safe anymore. Cedric, I'm not Cedric, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Yassine, uh, Major, you're 18 years old, you're about to go to college. When's the last time you felt unsafe in your environment? Um, Actually, I still currently feel unsafe in certain circumstances. Um, there are certain times when I walk outside and my anxiety happens to come up because you're never prepared if you're going to live to see the next day or live to see the next hour. And I'm also, I feel more unsafe for my family members too because um, one of my biggest fears is, you know, getting a phone call from somebody saying, oh, your brother's deceased over nonsense. And um, it's very, it's very easy. I feel like it's very, it's an easy access to get into the violence in like area I live in. Yeah. So. I, I'm not going to ask you the same question, Sylvia, because I see you nodding in agreement and recognition of what <clears throat> both Trinity and Yasin have said. But I, I do want to ask you about what you think the causes of this, and one of the causes that you have mentioned to our producers is that a lot of this is about respect. People just want respect. Is that the driving force behind many of these shootings? Do they, they feel disrespected? Yeah, so um, I really, sometimes I go out and I see guys when, they, when they're in groups, and especially at the Charlotte Trinity, um, it's more drama that goes on out there, and sometimes it leads to neighborhoods or Guys get chased back to the neighborhoods. Um, they bring more of the violence to where they live at than where they start. Mm. And um, when it comes down to the respect level with them, all they want is respect. And a lot of guys, when they bump into each other and somebody don't say excuse me too fast, they get real mad. The other person gets real mad or they want to take out a gun because they feel like if they don't have respect for them, they won't have respect for any of them. And you're, and you're making a point that Yassine told one of our producers about, and that is the need for education about conflict resolution. Yep. Uh, if you have a gun in your pocket, you're all too often ready to use it because over something that's just silly in, in some yep. way. Character. 
difference between character and conflict resolution is a big leap, I suppose, but uh, Yassine, um, why is that such a difficult concept for some people? Why do they have to be taught that? I feel like people are taught that because the only thing that people know of when it comes to solving solutions is ending their lives or just shooting them in general or killing them. Um, it's sad to say that not many people are educated to resolve conflict because they are there are other ways that you could resolve conflict. And I feel like not many people care for the students to learn about more of the conflict, like more of the ways to solve the conflict. So that's why. And, and Trinity, do you uh, think there's too much negative thinking which leads to violent crime? What do you mean by negative thinking? When people come together, they're never thinking positive. They always want to think something negative. We can never have a good time. Like, at turning point, when I was there, it used to be too much negative. That's to me, I'm going down the right path, the wrong path, as people say, but I can change that. I have my mentors that can help me change that. At the end of the day, we all have to stick together, either in front of the bad or the wrong. We're family no matter what, that's what I always say. I, I want to tell people I didn't know what turning point was, the school that you went to for a while. Yes, yeah, an alternative school. Okay, it's an alternative school for who've gotten themselves in trouble in other schools, and I think a lot of our listeners don't know about the turning point. Do you feel comfortable telling us why you ended up there? If you don't, we don't have to talk about it. That's fine. I ended up there because I disrespected my teacher. I wanted to get my way, but now I learned that I always can get my way. So I spent 90 days there, my mentor, Tawanda Brown, Lady at the Bar, has helped me get through it. So now I'm finally out and going back to my home school this year. I don't think it has much change on 
Because what impact has your decision to go into criminal justice had on that? They they slide away from me. <laughs> <laughs> they look at me in awe and they slide away from me because they don't like that. You know, uh, Chief Kirkpatrick said when he was young, he didn't like cops either. That was the chief of police. Uh, what attracted you to that field? I wanted to help people my age and younger, mental, and some people older than me, because I know people older than me, some of them, the majority, don't have the same mindset that some of us do have. And uh, they kind of act more childish than I do. And I am a I'm still a child, according to my parents. <laughs> so um, I just want to really help people mentally when they, before they step outside to even get to any kind of crime or commit a crime. I really want to step in when that's about to happen and isolate. You have seen, you have seen, you have said that you've seen kids give up on life from a lack of support, and, and that when they do, we should not be surprised that they resort to bad behavior. What kind of support do you see lacking in the lives of a lot of these young people? Uh, Take that microphone. <laughs> um, as far as support, I feel like we are lacking most um, children <coughs> my age that go to this way would be like of two parents. Like, I myself live in a single parent house. So I feel like because not many children live in a house with two parents, mostly like their fathers, they don't have structural support. And then as far as like academics, I feel like not many children are academically supported. Like they- By they teachers, by parents, by whom? All of them. <coughs> by counselors, teachers, I feel like they don't talk with students about like college life and life after high school. They just talk about receiving a high school diploma. That's it. That's what most people talk about. And yet, you too have been uh, you've been attracted to law enforcement. You were an intern at CMPD. Are you still? Um, no. That was just, it. Was just last summer. Okay. Well, how, how obviously you're going to college. How did you how, without the support you just said is, is lacking in some areas? How did you do it? Um, well, throughout my life, I've experienced some stuff. Um, I was, I'm the oldest child. I have five brothers and three sisters. So because I'm the oldest, I want to show my siblings that you can do it. And during my high school year, <laughs> during sometimes during my high school years, um, I've been homeless many times. And I felt very embarrassed and ashamed to tell people, in fact, this is the first time I public spoke about it. And during the time, most people, they accept the fact that they're homeless. Um, I just use my homeless as motivation for me for school and my future. Um, I noticed, Trinity, when Sylvia was talking about her accomplishments, that you were really enthusiastic in your support of her success. I'm curious, as you're, you're the youngest person up here, you're 15, I'm curious as to what your, do you have goals for your life? I do. And what are they? My goal is to be the first out of all my siblings to finish college and be a good person that I am. <laughs> You said to be a good person that I am. You said it in the present tense. Did it take you a while to get there, or did you always feel that way about yourself? It took me a while. Why? Because throughout my life, if there's a lot of people that doubted me and told me I was never going to be nothing, but once I got to that certain step and I had some important people in my life, Charlie Henderson, Cedric Dean, and Tawanda Brown, they made they like um, they made me be the person that I am. So throughout my life, I'm never going to forget them. So I'm always think about them. Wow. Well, you're going to go 
you're, you're studying uh, uh, law enforcement, so be it. And you want to be, I'm told, a crime investigator for the FBI. Yes, sir. I'm going to move away from you. <laughs> uh, what does it take to do that? just get on with crime scene investigation. I mean, me working my way up to it, I think that's the easiest point. But um, it, I think it takes a lot to get there. So, so when you do that, can you figure out a way to interface with people who came from, who come from backgrounds like yours? You're, you're, you're going to be this FBI person. Are you going to be able to go into the neighborhoods and, and deal with people who came from backgrounds like yourself and helped them. You know what? When you, it's the way you talk to them. It's the respect that you give them. You know, behind behind everything that they think about, only thing that they want is somebody to come to them and talk to them genuinely. So that's, I think that's what they really need. They need a genuine person to talk to them genuinely. And you're doing that. You're mentoring young people today. You yes. said that a lot of them come from abuse situations. Yes. And that you talk to, you approach them with gentleness. Yes. I have two nephews that I hang around all the time and I ask questions to all the time. And them are, my nieces and nephews are the only people other than other kids. And even my mentors, I really want them to learn from what I'm doing too. So, they're as supportive, as supportive as, as they are for what I want to be in the future. I'm all for it. And I see you're going to UNC Pembroke in the fall and be a freshman, and you want to major in uh, the law, uh, eventually you become an attorney, uh, and work in family and immigration law, and maybe run for Congress. So, when you run for Congress, what do you think you'll be focusing on? Well, um, my goal is to focus on more of like local laws and national laws because I feel like there are some laws that are implemented in this country that are not fair. And as a politician, my goal, I want to work with like younger children because I want them to experience that politicians are not like a scary person, scary people like myself. And basically I want to give back to the community. I feel like the community has done so much for me, I feel like I deserve to do some the same. So let me bring it back to the reason we're here tonight, this community approach toward homicide prevention. And I ask each of you uh, from your own life experience and what you're involved in today and the people that you've been involved with that got you to sit up here on this panel tonight. What do you think, the sol what solutions or ideas do you have about how we can cut down on the number of homicides? I'll start with the youngest person, Trinity. Because you've got your stuff together, kid. <laughs> you do. Um, well, well, I think that first. I mean, you, you told us that before, before we started, that you have had a, a close friend who was killed, who was uh, killed by a gun, right? Mm -hmm. um, and as you go through the community, as you live your life, what do you think is the glaring thing that we're missing? That if we just tackle that, mm -hmm. we put a dent in this. Well, like, like she didn't even do nothing wrong. So it was like, that was just out the blue. And it's just devastating me because it's like, if I was her age, that could have been me. And it was like, just like, why we just can't stop putting the guns down? I always thought about that. Like, I go to school and all people talk about it. Oh, I want a gun. Oh, I have a gun. But you don't talk about your education. You don't know how much importance it is into you and it's for your life. You need it throughout your life. Like, you do not need guns when you for us, like, when you go to sleep, when you go out oh, here and there. Like, we understand you're trying to protect yourself, but you do not need it to shoot people. So, 
Same question. What can we do? Well, what, do, you, do you have an idea of what we can do to make a dent in this? I feel like we should be more um, approachable to people, be more involved in our community, um, more activities, more programs, keep people really level out. Um, keep them to keep more younger people my age, her age, to keep doing something that's actually positive, give them something to think about or look forward to in the future. Because a lot of them don't have much to look forward to in the future, and a lot of them don't, don't expect change. So I think it's more of the activities than um, just being more involved. Yasin, you get the last word. Um, Hold the mic up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I believe that not enough children or people are so, they're not, they don't know um, what the world has to offer. And I feel like that, as I said earlier, not many children, they get enough support through um, any of these issues. And I feel like <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel like because children, they're not, um, since they're not trained on other ways or other conflicts, they're so quick to just shoot and shoot and shoot. And I feel like all we have to do is just educate them on other ways, resolve conflicts, offer like classes in different communities. Because I myself, I watch people die right in front of me. Not in front of my face, but I watch people die on TV. I watch, I watch my mom get shot at over a car dispute, and I feel like if you just talk to people about different ways that you can solve solutions, then maybe the um, this wouldn't be as much as a problem. Yasi Major is 18, Sylvia Clark 22, uh, both pursuing careers or college educations and careers, and uh, uh, Trinity Snowden came to us at the very last minute before we, just, just before we started the show, who is 15 years old. Thank you for participating. <laughs> Financially stable. I feel like school's focus more on math, 
but are teachers able to communicate to young people who have all these other concerns in their lives, all these negative things in their lives, how important an education is in getting you out of that situation and into other things? Are they communicating that? And do you want to jump jump in here, Robert? Or Sir, can I, Sir, can I, okay. Sir, can I double tip? So again, I think schools need to spend more time on this stuff. I talk about those three things, but they work on is community norms. And schools don't do a good job on community norms. For the young lady, you have to go to turning point for six mm -hmm. months because she disrespected the teacher. That right there is an issue. Now, if you need, if you want to turning point for that, why, why that? Because if I was at Dilworth and I told the teacher to shut up, I'm not going to turning point. That's an issue that we have to do. And, and the thing about it is when you suspend the child for doing that, right, mm -hmm. they go home, they come back, then they go back to doing the same thing. So we know the kids who are most likely to end up dead or in jail, but we do nothing in the school to get them the help that they need. So schools need to be working with social service and some of the agencies and it can be an information sharing network to say, look, Trinity, the way that she's doing right now, she's on the track to end up in prison or dead because she can't keep talking to people crazy like that. And then get somebody in there that can help the schools have to play a role in doing and in sharing the information. I can tell you one thing about the schools not being able to do much for um, kids out helping kids outside of just education um, for school. One thing is the teachers judge the kids. Mm -hmm. The first thing they do when they walk through a hallway is judge a kid. And when the kid looks at the teacher and the kid and the teacher looks at the kid, the kid is looking like, uh, excuse me, why are you looking at me like that? You know? So it's some kind of stereotype from the teacher to the kid. So, I mean, it don't matter what you wear, it don't matter how you think, they're not teaching you how to mentally think, or they're not teaching you how to wear your apparel. So, I think that's one thing that they should stop doing, and they should start teaching more of how the kids can greatly think of themselves instead of judging them. Bill and Bob. Yeah. I'll put them down. Over here. Yeah. Uh, hi. John Crow. My uh, family's been in Charlotte for a number of generations, and uh, I have my own set of beliefs on the issue. And uh, I feel the conversation's a bit divisive. Even amongst the panelists, I see a, a divisive nature between what you all are saying. And if you, you were to ask me, what we need to do is unify. And we need unity among the community members, and we need to address our leadership. I feel the issue is with our leadership. Prior to your question, I would have said our school leadership, but we all know we don't even have a superintendent right now. You know this, you address this on your show daily, I listen. We also don't have a, a police chief I would trust. Mm. I see crimes happen on the streets daily. That, hell, it's in front of the police station. I, I saw a naked man walking down Central Avenue in front of the damn police station. It's not that hard to go out and do I'm a civil engineer, I do my job. I provide a civil engineer for the city. Please, as police officers and educators, just do your job. Educate the children, do enforce the laws that we all agree to enforce. That's why you have that job. This is not a, if, if you ask me the community approach, I, I agree with it, but in response to the CMPD, I, I would say it's, it's, it's an issue that they still need to, to work on. So, along with us, along, we, we, we should still be working with you. I don't, I don't think that was a question. <clears throat> yeah, I want, I want to clarify something. Greg, you would like a question. It will be my question. Between the three of you gentlemen, why can't you come together and unify that's for what a I solid was, response that's what I was to this thing? We that would be a question. We have a very, a very good working relationship. And, and that's the thing, for real. All of us, that's why we're up here together. Because we work together. And, 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 and I appreciate your passion. I really do appreciate your passion. And I'll be honest, right? We need individuals like you to come into schools with us, to come into communities, and teach some of them young kids the way they did. I got a 
pocket full of cards, I give you one, then you can come out here and be a part of the solution too. I'm gonna I'm second it. Let me second that. Um, you can go to hillshawman.org, sign up as a volunteer. Um, we are no longer in the era of this. All right, everybody on this stage up here got two thumbs and is pointing at us. We are talking about what we're doing. I'm, I work with Julie, I work with Luana, I work with Fibs over there. We all cleaned up our community the other day. I work with us, Chief Putney, I, you know, we did new training with Chief, like, but what are you doing? What are you doing? Your, your service is not your job. Let me, let me just let you know that. You can work and do something out of work. What are you contributing outside of your profession to the community? Who are you mentoring? Who are you helping? Who are you sowing a seed to? If you ain't doing that, then you can't question any unification that's on this stage, because me and Cedric work way too hard to anybody to question how much we work together. I, listen, the America got the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force. They all protect this country, but they do it a different way. All of us on the stage are protecting these kids as much as we can, and we go about it a different way. And that's the only way we're protecting these kids. I'm going to ask you guys not a critique, but, and people will read in the paper all the time about Robert's bashing the police. And I bash the police when I think that the police need to be bashed. But one of the things that he said about them and working, and he saw a man that was naked and enforcing the law. The one thing that I will say with that, we got Sheriff McFadden, and we got uh, Chief Putney. And the Charlotte that I knew back in 92, not only would the guy that was naked get stopped, he even got beat for being naked, he even got put in the police car, beat on his way to the police station. Chief Putney is trying to figure out his best way to handle people's sort of mental crisis. Chief, uh, Sheriff McFadden has turned to jail, and you're not even called an inmate in Sheriff McFadden's jail. You're called a resident of the county inside the jail, and you're going to get wraparound services. So we also have to look and start thinking about how we frame who's a criminal and who's not a criminal, and how punishment should be given out. Because not only does it affect how I'm working when I'm talking about police accountability, but it also works when we're talking about here on the community side. Because if you demonize people that have mental issues, if you set it up to where people feel, she said the, the, the best I could ever say it. And most conflict resolution trainings spend this much time on respect, and they spend all of the time on all of this love. But get you killed in these neighborhoods is respect. I didn't kill you because you talked to my girlfriend. I didn't kill you because you stepped on my shoe. I killed you because you didn't make eye contact with me and say, bro, I'm sorry I stepped on your shoe, bro. I'm sorry about that. That right there gets you killed. And that's not just started this year. That's what got you killed since Adam and Eve and Steve and all of them. Until we address it, it's still going to be a problem. Okay, let me go over here. Uh, yeah. Hello, uh, my, my name is uh, Hank, and um, I have, um, just like you, Robert, I grew up in Charlotte. I'm a 70s baby. So I guess what I would like to present to the panel is that I can't understand how is it that in the 70s and 80s, I was able to ride my bike from Borough Village to Dalton Village, and when my mom got home, she knew exactly what was going on. That was one part of my statement. The next part of my statement would be, I would like to commend the youth up here for uh, owning their responsibilities and reaching a bar that was set for you that was not going to be moved. You reach that bar and, don't, and understand that that bar is constantly going to move. So you have, you have achieved one bar, and I, I, I would love to see you reach the next bar. My question for the panel would be, how do you unprogram the programming that's been in place in regards to Chief Putney cannot do his job unless the information is given to him so that he can prosecute those criminals. So if the, if the rule on the streets is don't snitch, and so if he can't, if nobody is snitching, then how can he do his job? It's about self-accountability. 
um, in regards to helping him do his job. So we can't complain about what somebody can't do for us unless we're willing to do what we need to do for us. So let me let me answer that question for you. First thing, let me clarify the snitching rule comes from a, a person that was a part of that culture. Please do. Snitching only applies to me and Greg said we want to rob a bank. Thank you. And when in the midst of us robbing the bank, right? We get in the bank, I get caught. Greg over there hiding in the bushes. I said, come on, God, Greg, and got us. That's snitching. <laughs> Talk about and, and I, will, I will give credit where credit is due. Before you had Sheriff McFadden, you had the I am homicide McFadden, you had the Uncle G Gary McFadden, the person that walked the streets right that solved 835 murders because people would come up to him and give him information because they saw him every day. He would buy him something to eat, he would do all kinds of stuff. So, what we have to go back to is putting people in the, Gary McFadden was on West Boulevard. Gary McFadden looked like West Boulevard. If you put officers on West Boulevard that don't look like West Boulevard, you're not gonna solve a person like that. Can you say the snitch on home again, please? Do <laughs> uh, y'all understand that it's two people in criminal behavior, one is getting caught and then he tells on another. If you are not in criminal behavior, right, protect, right. that is protecting your community. That's what I mean. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. If, 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 you, if you know who did something and you're afraid that if you tell the police, they will identify you as the person who told them, doesn't that put you in jeopardy? So, um, so I'm going to talk about this because I'm in the neighborhood it's not the doors and say that. I know who shot somebody the day that they shot somebody. It's because they got trust in Robert, in whoever. Now, if you want to go and share it, you can share it, just don't use their name in it. That's why they make them tip lines. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to do stuff. I have people all the time that say, I know what happened, and I don't want the money, I want them to be brought to justice, but I got to live with them. Then, are you, now that you were mad about people snitching, are you man enough to go and be the person to go and tell them? Because I see it all the time. I see it on people being shot and people walking by because it's pretty much the same as snitching. I don't want to call 911 because I don't want to answer the question. That's worse than snitching because the guy's bleeding and you're scared to call 911 because you're scared to talk to the police and not because you call 911. You Black or white, you prime suspect for right, you. Right. And I see that just as much as I do snitching. Now, I said one last thing, right? And this is great from prison. So they had the same problem in prison, right? You know what they started doing? They do what you call dropping notes. So dropping notes is if you live in a community and you know who killed somebody and you don't want to get credit for it, right? You take, type a letter up, write a letter. Put it in a piece, put it in, a, in an envelope, and send it to the police. That's all you gotta do. Nobody will know that you did it. They're not gonna really come out there trying to trip on that. The reality is this right here. If you don't do that, you yes, are protecting yes. the killers. Yes. And they're gonna keep killing you until yes. you get tired. And if you call and on that crime stopping number and you don't want the money, I already told you how hard it is for Craig and the Okay, let's go over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, thanks everybody. Thanks for Thank you and, and your radio station for coming out tonight and all the audience you're here, obviously because you're here. You gonna tell uh, everybody who you are? Uh, I am Tia Brown, Beauty After Bars. I do help major trends. <laughs> I just want to make a comment. I want to let the youth know this is for the youth because I pour into the youth. Adults have their mind made up. They're going to do whatever they want to do. That's fine. Amen. I care about our youth because I did have my daughter in prison. I have two girls. They're both in college. They've never been involved with the law. So I wanted to make it my business to make sure that my girls did not go on the other side of the law and be in handcuffs like I was. Not only did I have my daughter in prison, I came home 
couldn't find a job because community don't accept us, returning citizens, I went back. And I was a young college student at John C. Smith University, honor student, white collar crime. Didn't kill anybody, didn't rob anybody, but it doesn't matter. A second chance, I see Project Boat over there. I raise butt everywhere I go. I believe in second chances. But what I want to know, I want, I want our community to know about our youth. It doesn't matter where you come from. We have loving people like Cedric, like Greg, like Robert, like Gemini, and a few other people in here. I see Winston in here. I don't even have a look around, because I see the same people, Luana, Pat Coffin, and forgive me if I, if I miss some of our politicians, okay. but at the end, I can't see everybody, but at the end of the day, I want our youth to know that no matter where you come from, no matter what your zip code yes. is, no matter what your parents did or did not do, yes. no matter what shoes you have on your feet or don't have, no matter what bus they put you come out, because I'm born and raised in Charlotte, 48 years old, and I know I don't look like it. 48 years old, you can be anything that you want to be. So keep pushing forward. And I'm going to keep pouring into you. I'm going to keep begging for money. I'm going to keep knocking on the doors. Right. I'm going to keep fundraising so I can make sure Trinity goes to school for a scholarship and she has clothes to wear. I love you, Trinity. I love all our youth. The youth matters. They are our future. Yes. We come together as Trinity. You guys are going to make it because I'm going to make sure of that. Amen. According to CMPD, I talked to Lieutenant Koch today, so. Okay, and I have a two-part question. So second part is I have a nephew that is about 14 that is getting into everything, but there is nowhere for him to go. Did, are we going to have any? Oh, you got some more fun to go right here. I don't <laughs> need that now. No, I don't need that now, but we, like, he, I mean, he comes from a good background. He doesn't come from broken home. He, he understands, but he's choosing this. And it's hard to get through to him. How many organizations, how many people like you are there, out there, doing something similar to what I can count. With passion that you're doing. I can count and keep counting and keep counting. Yeah. How many organizations, how many programs? How do you get connected? Yeah. How, how does you connect your net? I mean, for one, you can go to um, Megan's um, map that they have with all of the programs that are in Charlotte. Who's school, Matt? Out of town. Who's Matt? Out of, out of school time. Mechhead is an organization. Mechhead, okay. yeah. Um, they have a website that has every program in Charlotte, whether they have transportation or not. It's a map that they have on their website. Um, I actually, y'all seen started volunteering through Mechhead. Um, you are more than welcome to bring them to Hill Charlotte. You can bring them to Save. You can bring them to Project Vote. You can bring them to Men of Destiny. You can bring them to MEN. You can bring them to Beauty at the Park. It's so many people that are out here working so hard at making sure that these kids have somewhere to go. But if we don't have the support from the rest of the city, you will never know it and you will never see it. it the word travels by mouth more. And like Robert said, we aren't those big organizations that have all this funding that you're gonna see all of the time. But we here. And if you contact one of us, because this has happened, I, 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 I honestly mean this, if you contact one of us, if there's a need that we can't provide, we will refer you to an organization that will. The MEN has done that with me, Gary Crump. I, like, I've gotten kids from other people. Me and Cedric has cross-served kids sometimes and didn't even know we had the same kids. You know, get me in my neighborhood. I'm like, yo, what up? You are more than welcome, more than welcome. And get our number after this. Um, I can tell you one thing about my mentor. He, he hangs out with those kids more than he hangs out with me and I'm grown. <laughs> so, you know, like even I have to talk to him sometimes about us even hanging out. Because those kids, it's his first priority. They're at his house at 9 o'clock in the morning. This, in the morning. This is, this is why we're saying we've got to treat violence as a public health issue. Because if it was treated as a public health issue, if I want to stop smoking right now, and I go to the health department and say I want to stop smoking, DSS gonna help me stop smoking. The hospital gonna help me stop smoking. I'm gonna get a referral. When you have Mecklenburg Department of Social Services and you can't call them and they can't take you to Men of Destiny, that Save, 
if you don't show it, the project vote, there's a problem. When you can go to any, because once we make this an epidemic and a problem, all of these services need to be working together. And it wouldn't be working in silos, because then I can call Julie, or I can call Pat and say, how come in the hell they went that well, How come they went to TSS? <laughs> how come they went to TSS and they couldn't find Project Vote? Because we're not treating this as a public health issue. If we did, that meant that the people in Dilworth, the people in Myers Park, would have to be as concerned about the murders up off the year as they are on other things. And I still want to say two things on community norms, and I'll shut up. That respect was huge. And I didn't learn this till I was married, because I didn't know I did it. If we stop uh, 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 treating women as an object, the number of crimes of murder would go down so dramatically because you wouldn't be beating your girlfriend and beating your wife. You wouldn't be killing other people because they said, hey, hello. Or even if he said something wrong, it is the fact that it's, it's those two things, the, the respect and objectifying of women, and those people do not talk about. They just always want to go back to, it must be bad black kids that don't have good parenting. And those two things go across the board. And if people would model those two things, I think you would see the crime or the murder rate in Charlotte drop dramatically. Let me ask you a question real quick. <coughs> this is a little known fact. CMPD, Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, has more programs than anybody. They got over 50 programs to help kids. People don't talk about that part of the police department, but they are putting your money to good use so you can call CMPD and ask for the Community Service Bureau, Major Nelson Bowen. He is the head person on the Community Service Bureau. They have over 50 programs. The Mayor's Mentor Alliance. Yeah. They have a whole list of organizations. I'm on them, you know. So when, when, when I tell you that, you know, you have Judy Eisen, you have a lot of people that's on the city council that make sure they get out in the community and they get lists put out there so that people know exactly what's going on. So a lot of times, you can just call the city council, and they can direct you to some of these resources that's going on because the city council is on the police department. So just use what you got at bed with. That's my type of man. One thing, too, so I met another one of my mentors doing the, uh, doing one of the uh, P pad tests for the, uh, Uh, JR Pat test for the the program I'm supposed to be in for the police department. <laughs> and <laughs> I met another one of my mentors through doing that Pat test. So they want to help. They want to help build young children. They want to help build young adults. It's I think it's a lot of people out there that want to help. You're you just have to introduce your kids to that because they'll be there. We're over time, but we have time for what? One more question, everybody over here. This isn't more of a uh, question, it's more of a statement. I'd just like to get everybody participation in what I'm about to ask you. For the sister right here that asked a question about the age group, me personally, I believe it's 18 to 30, because if you go back 30 years, mass incarceration happened, you took all of the males off the street, so our children started raising themselves, at an earlier age than need be, they didn't have no faults. But for me, it takes the transformation of the mind. Because once you transform the mind, you transform the heart. So I'd like to ask everybody here right now, be honest, who's afraid of spiders? If I let a hundred tarantulas go in here right now, can I see a show of hands? Can I see a, can I see a show of hands? Listen to this right here, because this is really important. Honestly, this is really important. The reason why our young children and ourselves as adults are killing one another is because we look at each other like we're spiders. You understand what I'm saying? Because every time you see a spider, you want to step on it. You want to harm it. But if you can transform your mind to see that spider as a butterfly, something that you just want to hold and caress and love, it transforms the mind. 
And that's what has to happen to our youth. It has to take a transformation of the mind and the heart. I don't care how many programs we put them in. They don't start transforming their minds. They're not going to love themselves in order to love you and to love me. So they're going to continue to do what they do. So us as adults, as we sit in here, we must cross barriers with each other. Because even though it's happening in the majority of the black neighborhoods, we need people from Myers Park, South Park, Valentine, and others to step in. If you have organizations that you know that's out here doing work, figure out how you can step in and help these organizations. Because they can't do it by themselves. City government can't help them do everything that needs to be done. Some of these youth aren't gonna go tell the police that they seen a murder. But they might come tell me, or they might come tell you after you built that bond of trust. So I just like for everybody to always look at one another and teach our kids to look at one another as though they're, they're butterflies and not spiders. somewhere that ask, well, give me some stats and give me some data and all of that stuff, and y'all tell me and Cedric to do these things, if you can, look to the right. They go your data, they go your stats, they go everything you need right there. Look to the right and look at these kids, look at these young adults sitting on this stage, voicing their opinion, wanting to go to law school, wanting to go be a cadet, want to save the world and be a better person. That is what we do all day, every day. That's it, right there. Let's start funding the stories, the kids, the real day. Them sitting here and not a number on a piece of paper that says I have 26 of them. Let's fund the real ones that breathe and that talk. That's it. WFAE has a mission of, of informing our community about our community. We want to hold the mirror up so that when you listen to us, you hear yourselves. And we can't operate in a vacuum. We know that we miss stories. We miss important stories sometimes. So if you know the story we want that we should be covering, or a conversation like this that we should be having, we want to hear from you, and you can email us, or tweet us, or search out one of our producers, Wendy Herkey, or uh, Aaron Kiefer, or Chris. Woo, Aaron! Uh, because we have the beast. the beast must be fed. And WFAE is a beast, because not only do we have the radio, we have our website, and a lot of this conversation will be on that website. Uh, we have all these podcasts now that we produce, all these different ways of getting information out to people. So we really are interested in what you are interested in. So help us find those stories. I want to remind you that this program that we just did will be here tomorrow morning at 9. With the music. <laughs> with music. We'll put the music again. And it will also be available online at WFAE.org and later on as a podcast. We want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming.